everyone. Welcome back. I'm actually excited to have Daniel uh, featured here in this video. Uh, we're doing a follow-up video to a charting video that I did earlier this year. Uh, we had back in February a update around that time that allowed us to actually expand the um, the view box that we had for SVG images. Uh, historically, we were kind of limited to square images, which I had some cool stuff a few years ago with icons and others, but you really couldn't do square charts that well unless you were doing um, something like a, a donut or a pie chart. And with the ability to actually choose your X and Y and make, make it very wide, a lot of spark lines and other little integrated charts have started to surface up. I did one initially with the help of uh, Daniel and Carrie on being able to do an IBS inspired one with a bit of an integrated bullet chart with a bar that uh, bled into it a bit that we'll be seeing here. But uh, since then, um, Daniel's actually done a lot of work to uh, continue to take that inspiration and actually show us different ways to add labels, uh, change the, the scaling, and a bunch of other stuff for it. So, uh, Daniel, I'm uh, happy to have you back on and also to be able to, to talk about charting again, which is, I know, something that we've discussed many times with many different tools. Yeah, always lovely to be back, Reed. Thanks for having me. Um, and Absolutely. it's so, so cool to see just what a couple of little changes in the table and matrix visuals and Power BI have been able to let the community do. So ever mm -hmm. since we've started seeing these new view boxes, there's all kinds of amazing stuff people are doing. So it's great just to be able exactly. to evolve on some stuff we've done and also just see what the community are doing. Fantastic. Yeah, and I, I will say that uh, as um, an interesting thing that was announced recently is the Back when we, I think last time we did our video and since uh, the updates to SVGs have been out, there was kind of three ways to do custom visuals primarily, which was uh, the SVGs and your tool, Deneb and Charticulator. And unfortunately, the sun has kind of set now uh, on Charticulator where it is like, uh, we're not going to depreciate it, but we're no longer going to actively maintain it, which essentially means that at some point, an update someday will happen to Power BI that will cause it to break. So... It's um, your your tool is now basically the only one in the market for <laughs> custom visual design um, uh, and outside of like scripting things from scratch. Uh, there is Plotly JS, which has a little bit of um, exposure, but I think the majority of the people that I know that build custom visuals have already been using Deneb. Um, but that's, you know, something I, I think that's, I guess, in a way, it's a nice pat on the back to have like the, the, the market a little bit cornered for the you know, number of people who need to build custom visuals. I mean, it, honestly, the it's just amazed me how Deneb has really struck a chord with some people that need more things. And I honestly didn't think it would be that popular. Um, but again, the community is showing us what given tools they can do. And it's incredibly sad about Charticulator. So I was a big fan of Charticulator. And it's honestly part of what inspired me to do a lot more in this space to try and help educate mm -hmm. people as to what they can do um, with the visual layer of Power BI. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping it's, it may be down, but not out. I don't know. We'll see if somebody's brave enough to take it on. Um, that's one option, yeah. but unfortunately it's not going to be me just because I got way too much time on my hands with, with tools like Deneb and we're doing heaps of changes there. Um, yeah. But like I say, we're here to really look at the core visual stuff and that, that's an awesome option for people that really possibly don't have access to, to custom visuals. Um, and then yeah, absolutely. it's been incredibly, um, it's quite flexible considering what we're limited to. So it's, it's always fun to explore. So when you come along with these little problems where, oh, we'd like to evolve the design a bit, can we do it? And it's like, yeah, can we, maybe we can. And we try and we try, and we, we, we push the boundaries a little bit more. And, and I think as a community, we, we learn together and, um, here we are today with another little trick that will hopefully push this a bit further. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, it's fun to expand the art of possible, as I like to, to use a lot with reporting. Oh, totally. I can flip over uh, to your screen if uh, you're ready to go, and we can uh, kind of yeah, that's great. what we've done previously um, and that you helped me out with, and then see how it's evolved from there. Yeah, totally. So um, we've got my Power BI desktop here at the minute. We've got a, we've got a matrix with a simple hierarchy. We've got some uh, regions and countries and some fictional sales, which are generated by the help of ChatGPT, which is really good fun, actually, just trying to create a fictitious company and, and explain their sales profile and how one region is doing relative to the other and uh, all that kind of stuff. But it was pretty good to get some sample data out that lets us explore this a bit more. So yeah, last time we caught up, we had a, you know, this, this idea of this uh, variance chart where we've got this micro chart. It kind of shows us we've got our origin, which is at zero. We've got our 
solid bar which shows us how much our actual measure is you know is is, is occurring um we've got this kind of target bar this black line showing us how our plan our pl is going and then this extra little mark this this rectangle whether it's green or red that shows us the difference so green obviously meaning we're exceeding our plan and red meaning there's a gap um, that we haven't quite achieved so we've got this you know this fictional company with fictional regions and fictional country not fictional countries but you know um these fictional stores in these fictional countries are not actually uh um some are performing well some are not performing well um we can do the usual thing by look at you know the, the year before and see that we've got some context change in our visual updates so we built this using svg so with that we have our you know we have our matrix or our table visual we have a special measure um that we let's just have a quick click on that so it's going to blow up the screen a bit um so i like to sort of organize these a little bit so this is our measure but what's really important is that we we have a category called image url so we build something in dax but what we're actually doing is producing a valid image for the web using the data that actually renders inside a table which is really really nifty so we've got all this stuff here um, and we won't dwell too much on it because we covered a lot of it off last time, but I have rejigged things a little bit because I've learned a lot about how to make my work easier when I build these things for Fox. And what I typically try and do is I sort of, I've heavily commented this and obviously we'll pass the workbook on for people to look in their own time. I sort of break my work down into the configurable stuff, I guess I'd call it. Some of it's not so configurable, but, um, some of the cosmetic elements. So we've got, we've put the width of our view box. We've got our colors that we want to use. We kind of put those at the top, some of the variables that affect the cosmetic elements. Um, and then underneath we have the contextual measures as I call them. So these are the things that we want to put at the top because they're things that are specific to our model or our business logic that we don't want to hide further down in the, you know, the, the weeds of what we're doing. So these are the yeah, things exactly. that we're trying to do that allow us to to quickly modify things if we if you were to take this and modify it you'd be able to plug your measures in a bit more easily than if we buried them further below um so i guess the key things that we're looking at here is we've got we've got our actual measure and our target measure those are just standard sums we have a variance measure which is just our actual minus our plan so that tells us our okay. gap um and then what we've got to help us with even scaling so i guess when we talk about even scaling let's just jump out of this again for a sec each bar, um, it makes sure that it's relative to the other bars. So what we're not doing is, you know, each row in a table is not aware of the other rows. So what we have to do is we have to create a measure. And what we've done is we've added this highest country for actual and plan. And what that does is that looks at which country has the highest actual. So in this case, we can see it's the US. So that is mm -hmm. copied for all of those rows so that we actually have that in scope and then our plan highest country again it's the us but it could be another country but what we want to do is to try and make sure that we understand what we're dealing with when we build these bars we have to have something that allows us to scale them correctly so that they're fair amongst the um the other bars that's one of the key points about a bar chart is you know i guess two key rules we try not to be too much of a zealot or in data viz. Um, but if we're aiming for this kind of visual, which is very, very um, starting to become very globally recognized, um, we want it to be, you know, it needs to start at zero or, you know, it's negative value, but the zero origin has to be clearly labeled so people can draw that conclusion. Um, and that scaling is a key part of that. We have to make sure that everything's fair and comparable. So it's essentially a, it's a, it's a max X on two values to determine whatever is the largest, because that that's going to be the thing that touches the, you know, the far right, just like a, native bar chart would yep yeah there, yeah, there you that's go. exactly so it's it so we're just doing we're just those two. making sure that we include the region while well, we exclude them uh, uh as we need to and we just evaluate that measure yep. so going back we've pulled all this stuff in so these are the measures we need those are the measures we saw in the table and then what we're doing is i sort of have this nice only modify the below if you want to change the calculation of the display logic it's basically just an instruction for anyone that wants to take this on here's where i'm starting to work things out so I build up my positional variables, as I call them. So these are things where I want to put the bars in the image. And I use percents to kind of scale them relative to the view box, because you can do that with, with rectangles and SVG, which is quite handy. Um, 
and I can tweak those if I need to, but this is generally where we try and advise people to stay out. This is kind of, if you want to mess with it, fine. Um, so these are the positional things that don't really change. And then next, what we're doing is we need to find where our chart actually starts. So it could be negative. It might be zero. Um, in this case, we're just worrying about whether it's the, the actual or the target. So we find the lowest and the highest values. And then underneath, what we have to do is create the span of values. So what we need to do is work out, you know, we've got the width of our view box. What we have to do is change our numbers, our, our, our metrics to physical coordinates on the screen. And we do this by producing a, a simple scaling operation. So we work out the span of values and then we create a number which divides the width by the span so that we've got a multiplier that says, you know, if we've got like a million dollars, how many pixels is that? That's essentially what we're doing here. What we do then is we create four elements in this chart. We've got our origin, which is our zero value. And what that is, is that's just a simple line. So what I do these days is I try and group together the logic and the template for the element. So what we see here is we've got a, a number that tells us our scaled origin value. That's where zero appears in, in the view box. Now, in this case, we don't have any negative value, so it's right on the, the left side, but it might need to be halfway along the box if we've got negative values. So this just makes sure that that works it out correctly. And then underneath what you can see is a an SVG element. So that is a, a line element. And what I've done is I've assigned that a class. And what a class does is it lets us do things like styling. So what I try and do is take my styling, my my cosmetic elements and, and try to have very minimal footprint in this part of my DAX code. What I'm really trying to do is just make sure the position is where it should be based on that origin value. And then what I've actually got here is a slightly, I've got a modifier that just says, um, you know, we want that line to be a certain width, but we need to nudge it slightly just so that it's inside the view box. So this is just a little modifier there. Um, and then we set the Y to span from zero to our top, uh, to our bottom uh, part of the view box. We then repeat this with the actual, so our next one is the, the, the bar for the actual, the, the gray bar. And this does a similar thing. It sets out the start and the end of the bar, and then it creates a rectangle based on those coordinates. So this isn't something we haven't done before, uh, but just for a recap, we're just going through and identifying these things. Same thing with the target, but the target has two elements. It has a, a bar, the red or the green, um, depending on whether things exceed or not. And then the marker, that line that we saw. So this essentially just abstracts that logic there. We have worked all these positions out. We've worked out, we've got an actual exceeds target in there, which is a true or false. And that helps us to determine the fill color underneath. So if our actual goes over our target, then it's gonna be our positive color. Otherwise it's our negative color. So we've got the SVG elements for those as well. And then as I said above, what I try to do uh, most of the time is set up what we call a style sheet. So for those of you that know HTML and CSS, you can do a similar thing in SVG. So what I try to do is to create known classes for my elements or the things that I wish to show. And then I push in those things that we declared up above. So the fill colors, the stroke widths that we declared. Um, and once that's done, I have a, a template underneath, which is the whole SVG, which we're gonna look at here. And I also have a, oops, use the use zoom it properly um, I was doing pretty well we have what's called a sort value so what happens in our tables um, when we put this measure in it becomes this big blob of SVG which is not a number so if we click on the column headers it doesn't really make it easy to sort so what we do is we, we kind of put in a, a value that respects the measure we wish to sort by which is what we do there we just format with leading zero so it makes a text value that makes sense relative to the measure and then I've got what's called a base SVG measure. So this is the kind of template that I use to create the SVG image. And then underneath, I've got these little tokens. So style sheet, actual bar, target bar, origin, and target market. And these are places that I will substitute in the things I calculated above. So this just lets me play with the design a little bit. What's really nice is if I, with SVG, the draw order dictates where things appear on the image. So when you move things up or down, you actually mm -hmm. change the order. So if I didn't like where the um, origin was, I could move it quite easily and retest, which I quite like. 
Let's go back into that measure because I wonderfully uh, removed the DAX editor because it's so good. Um, the last thing we do is what I like to call token substitution. So this is almost like a little power query um, operation. What I've done is I'm just doing step-based substitution. So for each, I'm taking this SVG base and I'm doing a replace on the style sheet and replacing it with the stuff I made above. And I'm doing the same thing with each token just to put in those SVG templates for each section that's been done. And the final thing in the return is I've just said, because with these kind of visuals, it's not always wise to have the bars in the subtotals and the totals because they can really push the scaling out. Now, it's the decision that you can make and you can modify your measures accordingly. If you want to you know, include the highest value is the total and see the other bars push down, you can totally do that. But what I do here is I just have a quick scope check with this has one value where I say if, if it's country, so the region will have multiple countries in it, um, we just return the the template or we return nothing. And and honestly, you, you may want to swap that out for an is in scope because is in scope is probably a little more relevant to the to the column. Uh, but in this example, it works. So how that translates, as we saw, we don't have bars for, for Europe, total, Oceania, North America, anything that's a subtotal or total, but we get these nice bars in here. So that's a you say quick, it's a reasonably quick recap. We could probably spend an hour or two just just on the theory behind it. But hopefully that gives you enough to, to wade in and figure it out. But ultimately, we get this bar here. Now, yeah, we come and the, to... The, oh. and, and one thing that I was thinking about for this too is the... And I think you might have run into this as an issue, but I found no way to actually identify lowest level exposed. So native conditional formatting in Power BI, all you have to do is click one of the little plus icons and the entire table sits to the lowest level because it can every row recognizes that some other row has been exposed, but I don't, as far as I'm aware, I don't know of any function to be able to scan the query holistically and determine if there's any particular row that's doing that. I think that is not something that you can code yourself. Um, uh, I don't, I don't think so, yeah. but I, I will be the first person to tell you that I'm not anywhere close to some of the people that can do stuff with DAX. So I think, yeah, yeah but I, I, I do think that there are just some features that, are using things even outside of the scope of a DAX function. Yeah, mm -hmm. like it, it's because it's built into the visual, it's connecting to other metadata that's part of the visual. It's like the fact that the um the title, you know, the native titles um have the ability if you use the default, it automatically shows you the level. It it yeah. it, it retitles it, but there's no DAX function that lets you fetch what the level is that's being displayed. Um so yeah. there there's there's there is extra behind the scenes information sometimes being added to the query that we cannot personally connect to, unfortunately. Um, so my, my solution initially was just to show this, as we do, um, without it. And the other one was is to do a, a, a second bar on it. But what you do is you change maybe the dark gray to like a blue or something else. So you have both, but the bars from their color formatting on, on the main amount is colored differently to kind of show the fact that they're at two different scales. So you can see both of them, but they're essentially two uh, scopes and two separate charts that are mixed together for you to be able to see each of them um, if you wanted to, or you'd go to like a waterfall chart or something else. But yeah, this is the easiest and simplest one that, that I've seen. And the, the other ones, you, you'd need to have extra considerations to make very clear that this subtotal bar is at, at a different scale than the one below it. Otherwise, these all would get a lot smaller. Indeed. I, I think you're you're exactly right. The, the waterfall type visual would probably be more appropriate. It does. I've seen people have a go at it, um, and but it always comes down to the you know rows only really know rows at least in terms of what we're doing. So it's always hard to. Yeah, there's probably a couple of things you can do, I think, but um, for what we're doing, I think this is quite clear. But again, yes, anything you want to do to modify this, including totals, subtotals, you've got to always bear in mind that they may really blow out the scale. So it it could really push like some of the, like New Zealand is a small you know, small fry in terms of this com company that could get really, really tiny. Yeah. Um, but it, it does lead us into this, um, I guess the, the crux of the challenge you've given me, Reed. <laughs> um, <laughs> what we'll do is we'll head over to this one um, and we're going to modify this design ever so slightly. So what Reed asked me to do was he, he, he had come across the idea of um, normalizing 
um, the data in terms of um, showing the targets all together. And what we mean by that is we, we can see I've got two charts here and I've got a slicer at the top. So I'll show you the finished recipe and then I'll break down what we've actually done because it's going to be easier to, to talk about what some of these measures mean. Yep. So we've got our original chart just here. This is the one that's on the, on the previous page. And we've got another one just like it, but this is actually connected to the slicer with a couple of changes. So when we change this to normalized, what happens is our scale changes so that everything is lined up, at least in terms of the target. So what it allows us to do, whilst this is not necessarily a like-for-like -like comparison in terms of the metric, it provides us with a way to look at how the percentage change is or isn't any better at, you know, it's, 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 it's a detail. It could, so, yeah. I mean, it, it, can, it converts everything to a percentage for one, but also it, it, it's an immediate eyeball scan scenario of you just knowing, oh, that this one, it, like they might've only had $5,000 in sales versus 85,000, but as a performance metric, they're performing better than any of their uh, uh, sisters or brothers, um, you know, in, in this list. Yeah. That's exactly yep. it. So we can see there's a big, you know, Canada's not doing as well financially as the US, but they're far outstripping the US in terms of their percentage mm -hmm. margin over their plan. Yep. And again, there are probably charts you might use in conjunction with these to show variance as a, as a dedicated percentage, but this allows you to draw everything together. Uh, and this is this is quite a common scenario when we talk about uh, a bullet chart rather than a you know an integrated variance chart. So this is kind of a combination of the two, where we can see everything relative to the target and everything's been lined up. So how we do that is with some additional measures. Now our measure we see we'll go into it in just a second. What we'll do is we'll show the difference from the previous measure because what we've done is we've integrated both using a slicer. So it kind of has elements of the original scaling and the normalization. But the things we've got on the table here show us what we really need to achieve that. So I guess the first thing is our variance measure hasn't really changed. We need the variance to, to draw the difference. So these three yep. measures here are basically the same as before. They're just there for us to you know check our working. The first one is the percentage of gap between actual and plan. Now, these are included for totals because I didn't leave them out, but this is just to sort of show you the differences we've got. So we can see that between the actual and the plan, there's actually about 37.2% for France. There's 44.1% for Canada. That's quite a high value and actually is the highest value. And what we do is we need to know for this normalization approach what the biggest gap is because that creates the biggest space to the end of the chart. So our 44% here is going to be the, the one that really pushes everything further left. Mm -hmm. So similar to how we did with our normal scaling, we get the biggest gap, which happens to be Canada. And we repeat that in this measure here. So if we look at that percent gap max measure, that's again, a simple max X using the same scope and just taking that percentage measure to get the highest value. And that's the great level of for us. What we then have to work out is the normalized target. And what I, what I mean by that is, what is 100% less this max gap? Because that's where we need to stick the target over here. This 55.9% is the proportion of the width of the view box where we need to start putting everything for it to line up. So irrespective of its financial value, with it, we're talking percentages here. So this is where this 55.9% is, is simply 100% minus this. And we can, uh, let me just find my, find my percent normalized target, there we go. We can see it's just one minus the, the max. It's nothing world breaking. But what we do is we use that as a way of snapping everything to this line here. So I'm gonna jump into Visual Studio Code now. Uh, Cause what, what's nice about VS Code, and I haven't, somebody else may be able to um, advise if not, but um, I quite like the fact that you can compare two files. So if yeah. I look at, this is my original measure that we just went through, and I can have a comparison between the new one, which is on the right here, 
And we can just quickly step through what I did to make it different. So rather than us wading through, because there's the code's building up now. Uh, we want to focus on what's changed. So I guess the key thing we've got first on the, so anything that's green has been added. Anything that is red has been modified or deleted. Yeah. Um, so on the left, we can see there's a red thing. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a sec. First thing we do is we pull in the value of the slicer. So the slicer is a disconnected table, and it's just got a measure that says if the normalized axis value is chosen, it's one. If it's not chosen, it's zero. So this is just a way of us getting a true value to say, yes, we want to normalize our axes rather than scale them. So all the stuff we've got downstream in our measure, we can then switch that logic based on whether we want to do the normal scale that we've seen before, where everything's the same, you know, actuals are actuals and they, they look relative to each other correctly, or whether we wish to normalize things. The next thing we need to do then is, so this little change here is just because I added some comments, so nothing to worry about. But then we pull in a, a variable that we're calling the max get percent, which is the value of that measure. So it's that um, 44.1. Um, and what we then do is we've got our same things. And then for our normalized target percent, we just pull in that inverse value. Now we could, we could work it out here. Um, and I often like to put all of my logic in an SVG, but because we may want to reuse this in different places, I've actually put it as a measure in the workbook. So normally I might actually work my measure out here, uh, but I've just pushed it back to the data model. Then what I've done is I've just broken out the, the highest and lowest value resolution, um, whether we're synchronizing or normalizing. And this stuff about the origin and the, um, you know, scaling the values, I've just moved that higher up. So we'll see a gap further below here where that's actually been moved up here so that it's with the logic that deals with the scaling. We've then added in some extra stuff for normalizing. And all we've done here is we're creating a variable called the target normalized value. And that is the width of the view box times that percentage. So basically 55% of the width, so about 100 pixels in this case, yep. that's where we're going to stick the line. Perfect. And now we've got the target normalized value. We can then work out our scale slightly differently to how we might do for being, you know, showing values relative to each other. And we create a ratio between the actual and the target. So that gives us a percentage that tells us how is the actual actually doing. Now that could be the same as the um, the variance that we saw. And we could sub that in if we wanted. And then we take that target and times it by the ratio to understand where the actual sits. So because the target is where we're, we're leveling, we also need to understand how actual sits because the value in money or whatever unit we're using is kind of meaningless because we're actually adjusting it relative to the other values. So that is uh, what we're doing. We're, we're saying, right, we figured out where the target sits. We figured out now based on the target, how the actual scales to the target. And then we multiply those together to figure out where the actual sits in terms of this new scale that we've built. And then underneath, not a lot really changes. The SVG templates are the same. The only thing we're really doing is updating the position of the X value for these shapes. And all we're doing here is we're saying, if we're normalizing the axes, which is that true false slicer value, mm -hmm. we use the normalized value or the synchronized value. And again, nothing changes here because we're just changing the way we calculate. So before the X pos actual on the left was, was always the scaled value, but now it's just switching it. And we do the same with mm -hmm. the target underneath. So we just use the target scaled for that, that value, which we already worked out up above. And then downstream, there's no other changes. So this approach we've built to building this visual holds up, which is quite nice. So just going back to have another look, and recap, we worked out where this sits. We calculated where this actual value sits now as a percentage ratio. And then everything else just worked. So Beautiful. that's really, I say, well, that's all there is to it, but it took some working out. <laughs> Hopefully well, I mean, it, it, getting, getting the scaling and also accommodating positive, negative, though I, I will say that if you're doing a normalized goal like this, you. I think it's almost too complicated visually to actually have a mixture of pos, uh, positive and negative. It, it's really 
these types of IBCS style bullet charts are, I think, more designed a bit for um, usually actuals versus budget or actuals versus plan, which most of the time is going to be, uh, you know, primarily just positive values or just all negative, one of the two. I've, yes. I've looked at a few of them when it, when it mixes the two in together and it, when you have things all over the place, one, you have a really wide range um, and it's, it's it, I think it overcomplicates it. Uh, but yeah, I, I think this perspective is my personal favorite bullet chart for sure. Uh, ever since I started working with um, IBCS stuff uh, a few years ago with like Inforever and some of the other custom visuals out there. So I, I very much like it and I'm definitely glad to be able to at a basic level before exploring um, more enterprise grade custom visuals to be able to have have a uh, a basic version of this just you know using the native matrix or table visual in Power BI. Indeed, and and the thing is, normalization is quite a handy technique anyway from a data analysis perspective. There's lots of times where I mean, we'll show hopefully a case where this may make a little more sense um, in a, in a moment, but. Um, understanding things relative to a normal is, is quite handy sometimes. So often things could skew um, based on too much, you know, distribution is too high or, or numerous other things like that. This can actually be a way of letting you look at things under a new lens. Exactly. Um, so what I'll do, Reed, if it's all right, is I'll just talk a little bit about how I can evolve this to maybe just reduce some of the noise in the table. Um, yeah, please. And then maybe we'll take a look at that other case. Um, so what I did was I just, I it took this a little bit further. Um, and what I've done here is push the, you know, this is the same approach. We can, we can look at it synchronized or normalized. Um, but what we've done is we've added these little labels in so that we can actually look contextually and, and see the, the numbers for target and actual. And what we've done is we've taken inspiration from uh, the IBCS where, you know, that they, they like to, you know, normalize units and, and have some pretty smart formatting around them. So, and this is one I, I borrowed from you, Reed, uh, was that this, uh, I've got a measure here for dan dynamic decimal places. And I can't find the deal. Oh, I know why. Let's try this again. So we've got a measure for dynamic decimal places. So we can see that the, the AC has a has a value and we've got that formatted fairly normally but we've got this dynamic formatted value that shows it as 47.9k this is leveraging a new feature of desktop not as dynamic formatting um so i've created my a favorite features this year yeah it's really year. really neat uh, we saw it in calculation groups and now we're starting to see it in base measures which is really really cool so when we've we've set our format to dynamic uh in the list if you've got the feature enabled, you can actually go to this little box here and set the format string. So what I've done is I've, this is a, a measure that Reed has in, uh, in his sample workbook, but it's just a way of in, sort of looking at the number of digits and the scale and returning a format string that matches the, um, the, the unit that we're looking at. So whether it's thousands or millions or billions or trillions, and this is kind of what some of the visuals do where you use auto formatting um but yep. read abstracted this this into into a dax method so i've taken this came from well there was kane schneider did one version he had an if error in his which i think was kind of expensive and this circumvents that end jeff weir if yep. i'm hopefully quoting this correctly that this is his pattern which is which was kind of like it was one of those evolved things where I, a couple of years ago they went back and forth a few times on formatting and i think this this was the final result of the fastest way to kind of do this. Um, but they both get the, the same formatting output. Yeah, it's it's really neat. So yeah, I've, I've seen this kind of progress over the over the years, but it's it's a really neat little. Uh, it little makes trick. table visuals also read so much nicer. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I throw this anytime somebody needs like a matrix table if they're doing native. Like I'm gonna give you a, a dynamic formatting measure. It still gets a little glitchy if you try to put that into a chart because then you have the formatting that's also trying to be overwritten by the automatic formatting in the, the chart visual. So I usually have a separate calculation for them, but I, I do just love it, how cleanly it displays for sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. I mean, I, we're only working in a scale of thousands here, but if, if, if we had mixed, you know, one mm -hmm. place was way outside the other into the millions, we'd, we'd still get really nice, concise labels. One thing I really like about this, and this is, this is a, a finesse thing that I tend to go for, which just adds a little bit of extra polish is if we can see here, the label has a bit of a collision. 
this 25.9K label has a bit of a collision with the target bar, and it's quite hard to work out that kind of stuff. Um, so what we've done is uh, we've done what's called a halo. So I might have to zoom in even further, actually. Let's just see if we can get even more zoomed in. Um, it's like a little white gap. That oh, goes, it kind of yeah, cause yeah, off. yep, yep. Um, you know, it makes the the number readable too, because like that's yeah. that that spacing is very important with some of that stuff. Even though you can't really necessarily notice it. Uh, okay, and it the K actually, if you scroll down. So did you? Is there a second version of that letter, yes. but that extends further, but it's it's colored white? Yes, that's right. That's exactly what it is. So the trick is to this with um, SVG. Um, yep. it's very hard to measure how much space that text takes because you have to think about font family, font size, the, um, the space, because not all fonts are monospace. So Sago UI is quite good with numbers, the font we're using here, because it's pretty much, um, you know, it's monospace when it comes to numbers, which is really nice, but it's not proportionally space. It's, you know, it's, it's not monospaced when it comes to letters. So the distance can change. There's all kinds of things to think about. And people often like, oh, it'd be great if I could put a, rectangle around it and you know reserve that space but it's very hard to calculate so the trick is yes it's it's another text element behind it that's just white and it has what's called a stroke around it so it's it's a border and what it does is it kind of follows the the line pretty well of the letter so that you get this kind of cutout that doesn't intrude too much uh, and you can play with the the widths a bit to you know that that k is a little extreme perhaps we could soften that down and 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 recover that but um we'll just talk about that relative to the measure because it's not too hard to do and all we've really done is added some extra cosmetic stuff we've said let's let's make some space so the label padding is how much space to leave on the right just in case um you know our, our values at the end which font family do we want to use um so what i've done here is i've added in Segur UI, which is the usual Power BI font by default, but I've added in what's called fallback. And fallback is something that's used in the web to make sure that if you don't have the font on the system, um, how do we look up the font if it's missing? So we, we start with this one and fall back to this one, and then this one and this one and this one. And that's actually good for devices like Macs where Segur UI is packaged, but it, it uses this name instead. Yep. So uh, Megan Longoria, um, came to me with a denim issue actually where we found that we just needed to be more prescriptive where if people were using the visual on a mac they could they could they could play with that um so our font size in point which is seven point we could change that to eight or whatever and play around with the cosmetics and the font strict stroke and the font stroke width for the label halo that's a bit of a mouthful um i've set that to three pixels but we could make it one or two to make it a bit less cutting if we wanted to um yep. but this is just that configuration part, again, pulling it up to the top. The positional stuff changes a little bit because we need to modify the width to take the label padding in because it's now not just the bar, it's text on the end of the bar. Um, and we're just changing the the Y positions a bit because we need to make some room at the bottom. So when we go back, you know, if we look at this visual real quick, we're using some of the bottom for this target label. So we've had to push the bar up slightly so we're changing some of the values to just make that move a bit. And then also where we put the labels. So the actual label has two positions based on whether it's positive or negative. Uh, you know, if it's negative, it's kind of above the bar. Um, and if it's, if it's positive, it's, it's on the end. So that's just a way of making sure we can qualify those. Um, we change the normalized target just to consider the width. And, and the percent, so nothing major, but it's just taking the labels into account. And then all we really do extra is build our text elements. So what's really nice is we work out the vertical position based on what we saw, but what's really cool is the dynamic format stuff. And this, um, I have to give credit to Ricardo Rincon and Ed Hansbury, who are two other MVPs that know DAX really, really well. Yes. This isn't something that works in the DAX formatter, e either in Power BI or currently Tabular Editor. But what you can actually do is if you have a dynamic format string, you can actually pull out the, there's a hidden measure in the report that starts with an underscore 
and the measure name. So that AC dynamic is my measure name and then format string as one word. So I can actually pull out the formatted value string and apply it to my number, which is really, really neat. So, so, so essentially you can reference any measures format string. I, I, I might have actually just learned something new. I didn't realize. I that. think it's only dynamic. I would have to. Oh, so, so the new dynamic format string gets in it. Because it has to be, a, that, well, it makes sense because the new format string is a measure, but it's a measure that's auto anchored to the first one, but you have separate measure windows. So that would make yeah. sense. This, um, this is yeah. cutting edge info for me, Reed. So I think um, yeah. I'm going to have to bow out here and say this is literally all I know about it, but I thought it was a really neat feature. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I like that. And my only other just comment is I'd be curious to know, looking at the new model view that's in preview, if you would actually be able to see that, because you can see the measures table in the model mm -hmm. view that I, I keep telling people is like hidden, but it's actually there. I would wonder if this would show up because that, that technically exposes every object or most of the objects that are in your model. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I'm not up on the new view. I've been really busy with with a couple of things recently, but it's, it's on my list of things to check. It'd be really yeah. interesting to know. But yeah, this was just a quick question I asked and I got an answer back real quick about this and I couldn't see it documented anywhere. So I'm hoping, um, you know, it becomes a bit more prevalent. It's pretty neat. Anyway, um, we then just have a text element for our label and we've we've applied the what I call the halo class to that to indicate that it's our one that sits behind. So this one goes first and that creates that white border um, and it's the same text just using those properties. And then the label we wish to see underneath and then our target label. So we create three elements for those. The target label is always out of the way. So we don't need to worry about putting a halo around it. So I'd always say only use it where you have to because you have to double everything up. So it's a great technique, but it is onerous if you want to use it all over the place. A um, couple of changes to the style sheet to add in styling for the labels. So we've got our regular label and then these all inherit from each other. So our label actual uses different positions based on where it is. So dominant baseline being its vertical position relative to where it goes. Um, same with the target. And then the text anchor is alignment. So it's kind of like left, right or center aligned, but they're called different things, start, end or middle. Um, and then the halo just says, make everything white and put that stroke width around it. Underneath, we just have an extra step for the labels. And same with the transform substitution process. So just make sure that's replaced with the um, the SVG. And that is, again, kind of all there is to it. Um, so that builds us a slightly more complete visual that we can, you know, if we wanted to now, we could take out these things. And we've just got a really nice compact visual that we can we can have in our in our report which is really really cool um yeah. and it'll be synchronized or normalized yeah the i think the ability to, to, to kind of show both and um kind of one also helps to even in a way like sell the idea of like look at how much easier it is to, com to compare these because it and it's something that i've been touting nearly 10 years since i've been doing reporting is the if you can ever get to a percentage ratio, that's going to be often some of the most fair comparisons that you can do across things that can often be very wide in scale. Um, so, you know, even having a you know, not just the percentage and you know, like an icon next to it, but you even having the bar that's normalized to those percentage deltas above or below, but still showing the original value too. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a nice hybrid, best of both worlds. So it's nice to be able to see that integrated in here. And um, again, like you know, shout out to just the IBSC standards. I'm, yeah, I, I won't quote on it, but I, I don't think I've ever seen that that specific type of bar chart with the goal that's been normalized to a you know a, a vertical line like that outside of anything that they've done. I, I think they, I believe that they coined it, so to speak, uh, as a design style. I thought that was one of their things that they sem semi-invented, but I could also just be misquoting. Yeah, well, actually, I actually have a an article they did in about 2016. I can quickly pull up if you like. Yeah, uh, I, I, I know it's not, the IBCS has been around for a while, but I know that one's, because they've, they've invented a couple, or they have refined a couple of charting types over the years to something that they find to be more um, practical and meaningful for mm. analysis and, and business, for sure. Yeah, that's right. So they, um, this is an old blog post, but um, this was them taking a conventional bullet chart and applying mm -hmm. their 
recommendations to it. So what they've yeah. done is they've, you know, I won't dwell too much on it, but they've, they've gone through and suggested how to approach, you know, how their design has been approached, um, and, but also ultimately ending up with this type of design, which is very similar to what we've yep. seen. Um, I think their case really is more towards mixed metrics. So where we may have KPIs that have lots of different scales to them. So we can see that revenue yep. is in trillions, profit is in percent, average order size is in US dollars rather than trillions. So these things don't, you know, if you put them next to each other, they just don't make sense from a scaling perspective. But also, you know, and, and we've we've got this in Power BI uh, mocked up just so you can see, you know, here's my here's my approach to it, just using the variance approach. Mm, and okay. you know we've we've got our metric and our unit and our values and what i've done is i've added a format string field so that we can start doing these dynamic formats just like we saw before um but we can see that they're, they're all different scales so they, the bullets yeah. kind of don't really line up and and it's hard to kind of do that at a glance kind of stuff so again we took the approach we've just seen previously with the normalization and and just just applied it and we can see here that we've got that same approach now where we can just look down, all the units are different. We've yep. got the dynamic format string stuff we've seen pulling in, but everything's normalized and everything has formatted and, and just works. So again, same approach, which has the biggest variance off the end and let's normalize it to that. So in this case, it's only 10% over, which is this, this fellow here. Um, so everything needs to be pushed to the 90% and then everything lines up and, and works. Now, wouldn't it be great if something like this could come out for uh, <laughs> Microsoft metrics or Power BI metrics or data activator where you, you'd have all those uh, comparative values, right? So it's, it's some base versus goal. Yeah, it's totally. And, and look at, but it, you know, ha having that charted online would be nice or just maybe the ability to, because I know you, um, I think today on those two, you cannot pull out the, the data from those systems, uh, even via the API, I believe, um, though I think they're, it's a it's something that at least is on the ideas forum, um, but they do have the their their visualizations that are available. Or metrics has its the visualization available in Power BI. But I'd love to see that kind of data like thrown onto this because it it you know it, it creates that normalized comparison as you mentioned, which is just even ignoring the labels, you can really quickly see you know the outliers of good and bad performers. Yeah, totally. It's it's yeah. such a neat little redesign, and and it just makes it's so easy to read. And it makes makes loads and loads of sense. I think one little thing I'll just I'll just bang on real quick as a, as a little Easter egg um, is the table currently doesn't let us do rich text very easily. Yep. Um, and we need a column in the table to generate the raw context. Um, so what I had a go at was just seeing you know if this IBCS uh, reference chart that we looked at. Yep. Um, th they have this bold um, text for the the category and the you know, the unit is in a normal text. So I just thought I'll, you know, I'll, I'll hack around and see what I can do. And I came up with this. Um, so this is, this is very, very hacky, but it could give some people some ideas. So what we have here is we have a, a column um, called, I've got called it metric formatted. And what I've done here is I'll show you in the table view. Um, I've got two columns. I've got, I've got my unit column and I've got what I've called metric bold. And what I did here was I, I went to a site called Yay Text. Some of you may, some of you youngins may be more familiar with these kind of things where you can, you can put text in and you can actually generate Unicode uh, formatting. So we can generate things like cursive script or, you know, bold italic is what we're looking for. So I put my customer satisfact in here and I've got a sans serif bold Unicode text that I can copy to the clipboard. And that will just go into my report as Unicode. So I've kind of fudged it with, um, you know, built my own dimension table with bold mm -hmm. representation, which is just the Unicode text um, with the bold. And then I've added a, a carriage return character, which is a, a character mm -hmm. 10. Um, yeah. So we can't see it in here, but in the table, um, it puts it on a new line. So yep. we kind of almost get there. So it's not perfect, <laughs> but it could give people a few ideas. No, that, that that's awesome, and I think with each of these, there there's a lot of art of possible. And every time we we do a video together, and uh, I encourage people to definitely uh, download the, the PBX. There will be a link um, to that uh, in the description of this video and on uh, my my blog site as well. So I recommend checking that out. And just as we're wrapping up, I want to flip over to here, um, but also just mention, of course, that 
as you're looking at this, if any of this inspires you, uh, also um, I encourage you to check out uh, Daniel's tool, Deneb, the custom visual that I'll have in the description as well below. Really useful custom visual builder that is based off of a open source uh, visualization language that was developed actually by University of Washington, where I'm from. So it's uh, right. something that's uh, <laughs> in my neck of the woods uh, in, in the world. Um, but uh, he puts a lot of time and effort into that for sure and continues to evolve that, which um, more than enough, uh, I think, is deserving of the MVP that you continue to get every year. So. Uh, thank you. Um, we've just had a big release that's just been approved to AppSource for Deneb, which is great. So we've got some new things coming in and then lots of stuff on the way. So yeah, we'll continue to keep evolving that and hopefully just giving people more stuff to do in Power BI. Um, but yeah, always always fun to come on and just, you know, these challenges are awesome. I always love these. So thanks for thinking of me and uh, setting me some fun things to work out. It's always fun to talk about them and, and then see where people can take them. That's the interesting bit. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. I, at some point, I'm sure we'll continue to have another visualization chat, especially with all of Miguel's stuff coming out. Um, oh, yeah. Looking forward to the next time that I get you back on to one of these videos. I would love to. Thanks for it. Thanks, Reed. And thanks, everybody. Please don't forget to like, comment, or share this video. Now, if this is your first time to my channel or you want to see more of these awesome videos, please click that subscribe and notification button. Also, feel free to show your support by becoming a channel member. Last but not least, you can download the file for today's video from my blog files page using the link down below. So until next time.